On May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh took off in his Ryan monoplane, nicknamed the Spirit of St. Louis, from New York. The world's first successful solo transatlantic flight landed in Paris 33 hours and 33 minutes later, securing Lindbergh worldwide fame. But Lindbergh's was not the only feat of aeronautics related to the St. Louis area to occur in 1927. Much less remembered, but no less daring, were the efforts of an Army officer, Captain Hawthorne C. Gray, to fly higher than anyone ever had before. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The quest for altitude records was part of early aviation from early on. The first altitude record of 24 meters, or 79 feet, was recorded in August of 1783 by French aviation pioneer Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier in a balloon made by Joseph Montgolfier. Less than a year later, he took a balloon to over four kilometers. In 1862, Englishmen Henry Coxwell and James Glacier piloted a balloon called Mammoth so high that Glacier lost consciousness and Coxwell lost all sensation in his hands. Coxwell had to climb the balloon's rigging and loose the balloon's vent with his teeth in order to descend. It was an incredible feat that showed the dangers of flights at such altitudes. While later estimates were that the balloon reached an altitude between 35,000 and 37,000 feet, 10,700 to 11,300 meters, the last barometer reading was at 29,000 feet, or 8,800 meters. Perhaps because they nearly died, there wouldn't be another attempt for such altitudes until 1901. The attempt was made by German professor Reinhard Suring and Dr. Arthur Burson of the Royal Prussian Meteorological Institute in a balloon called Prussia. The Prussia had certain advantages over earlier balloons, most notably being made of rubber, which had the advantage that the balloon's upward motion did not decrease with altitude, making measurement more reliable. They also had a better instrumentation, including the barograph, which tracked the barometer results automatically with ink, as well as the use of bottled oxygen. Their flight on July 31st again showed the risk of these endeavors. The two balloonists later wrote, At between five and six kilometers in height, we began regularly to breathe oxygen. And after about three hours, we had reached a height of 8,000 meters, and after four hours, 9,000 meters. The influence of the air now thinned by one-third due to atmospheric pressure and cooled to a temperature of minus 32 degrees centigrade was evidence in an increased sleepiness. The last observation series covering both pressure and temperature was written down promptly and clearly at 10,225 meters. And soon after that, we both fell into deep unconsciousness. Burson pulled the safety valve several times immediately beforehand when he saw his companion, Suring, already asleep. Even carrying oxygen, both pilots passed out due to hypoxia, and they only barely recovered in time to check the balloon's descent. Officially, the balloon reached a height of 10,500 meters, or about 35,000 feet. It might have gone higher, but the ink on the barograph froze, and no higher altitude was recorded. The flight of the Prussia was important. It reaffirmed the accuracy of measurements that were being done by unmanned sounding balloons at the time, and in doing so, it helped to learn about the Earth's atmosphere, including the discovery of the stratosphere. But perhaps because both pilots nearly died, it would be more than two and a half decades before there was another attempt to break the altitude record. Born in Washington in February 1889, Hawthorne C. Gray had served as a private in the infantry in the Pancho Villa Punitive Expedition in 1916. He had promoted to second lieutenant at the outbreak of the First World War in 1917 and was stationed in Hawaii, where he met and married his wife. The couple would have three children. In 1920, he was promoted to the rank of captain and entered the U.S. Army Air Service, becoming a balloon pilot. A November 1927 edition of the Oakland Tribune noted that he attended the Army Balloon School at Ross Field in Arcadia, California. He was then stationed at the Army Balloon and Airship School at Brooks Field near San Antonio, and finally Scott Field in Illinois, just outside of St. Louis. Established in 1917, Scott Field was named after Corporal Frank S. Scott, the first enlisted man killed in a military airplane crash in September 1912. The field was designated for the Army's lighter-than-air branch, and in 1921, the balloon and airship school was moved from Brooks Field to Scott. Gray served as executive engineering officer in charge of aeronautical development. Gray represented the U.S. in important balloon races, really endurance tests where the winner was determined by which balloon landed furthest from the launch point. Notably, Gray and Lieutenant Douglas Johnson finished second in the prestigious International Gordon Bennett Cup in Belgium in 1926. But Gray was intent on going higher. 
new technology he believed would allow him to beat not just the record set by Suring and Burson in 1901, but also the record set for an airplane set by pilot Jean Calizo in November of 1926 at 12,422 meters, or just short of 41,000 feet. While Time magazine notes that he was credited with flying higher than any man, that record would be stripped in 1928 as officials concluded that he had falsified his barograph record. Hawthorne was ready to make his first attempt to exceed 41,000 feet in March 1927. He launched from Scott Field at 1.18 p.m. on March 9th. The flight was supervised by famous aeronaut Albert Bon Lambert, president of the St. Louis Aero Club, there to document the flight for the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, a governing body for aerosports that had been formed in 1905. Lambert was known for developing Lambert Field in St. Louis and provided financial support to Charles Lindbergh, who would make his transatlantic flight in May of the same year. Hawthorne's balloon was called the S-80-241 and used 80,000 cubic feet of hydrogen lifting gas. He wore a special suit, which the St. Louis Globe Democrat described as a heavy fur-lined costume. He carried a parachute, a radio, three tanks of oxygen in an apparatus that kept it heated with a tube that ran into his leather helmet, and specially designed knives for cutting bags of ballast. His radio was working fine. Programs broadcast by radio station KMOX and KSD from St. Louis came in very clear, he told the paper. I had pretty smooth sailing until I got around 20,000 to 25,000 feet, he told the paper. But then things started to go wrong. He started using oxygen at 12,000 feet, but made the mistake of trying to take it through my nose instead of through a tube in my mouth. The Globe Democrat explains, In the rare atmosphere and sub-zero temperatures, he became unconscious because improperly adjusted tubes failed to supply him with sufficient oxygen from the three tanks in the balloon basket. The problem could have been deadly, but the balloon was built with a fail-safe. It would automatically start to descend if he stopped dropping ballast. The paper wrote that Captain Gray explained that the balloon began to descend after he overshot his equilibrium. But that didn't put an end to the problems. When he awoke, the balloon was descending too fast. The paper reports he regained his senses at 17,000 feet to find his balloon falling at a rate of 1,000 to 1,200 feet a minute. Dizzy and intensely cold, he aroused himself and began throwing out sand ballast to check his fall. But his specially designed knives quickly dulled from use, and he desperately started tearing apart bags with his bare hands. In all, he dropped more than two tons of ballast in the flight. In the end, the basket hit hard, crashing through telephone wires and landing some 40 miles southeast of Scott Field. He came down in a ditch at Ashley, Illinois, causing a commotion over the countryside, the paper reported. Some of his instruments and his radio were broken, but the paper writes he emerged from the landing with only a slightly sprained ankle. A chase plane took him back to Scott for a medical evaluation, but an examination showed that he was little worse for his experiences. While the one hour and 47 minute flight did not reach the desired altitude, it was, the paper notes, fruitful from an empiric point of view. Hawthorne had learned to better adjust his oxygen and that a new system for dropping ballast was needed. Colonel John Peglow, commander of Scott Field, told the paper that he was well satisfied with the flight. Captain Gray went higher than I expected. The paper concluded that he planned another attempt in early spring. That attempt came on May 4th, 1927, 95 years ago, today. Taking off from Scott Field at 1.33 p.m., this time his electrically heated oxygen worked perfectly, as did the new system for releasing ballast. The Akron Beacon Journal wrote, America apparently has captured another balloon record with the ascension of Captain Hawthorne C. Gray, Army aeronaut, today to a height of approximately 41,000 feet. It is believed that this is the highest altitude ever attained in a free balloon. From his basket, he surveyed the earth from a distance of nearly eight miles. Gray ascended until he started to feel pain in his chest. The Philadelphia Inquirer wrote that Gray, in a matter-of-fact manner, said that he felt normal until he reached the maximum height, when a pain in his chest occasioned some discomfort. Medical officers had cautioned him to go no higher in the event that he felt any ill effects, and he started to descend. An officer of the Army Medical Corps told the paper that Gray had reached the approximate limit of human endurance in rarefied atmosphere. In fact, it took some effort to coax the balloon to the record. The Inquirer writes, Gray said he rose to 40,000 feet and remained stationary. The sand ballast had been discarded by this time, and he attached one of two oxygen cans to a parachute and dropped it, and this enabled him to rise the last thousand feet. When the Akron Journal asked him about the sensations that he felt when it reached 60 degrees below zero at 41,000 feet, Gray answered that the only thing that felt cold was the back of his head. 
The paper noted that Colonel Peglow observed with a humorous glint that that was because of Gray's bald head. But as with the first effort in March, when it dropped, the balloon dropped too quickly. The expectation was that the deflating balloon would act as a parachute, but it didn't. The Inquirer wrote that the balloon descended at such a rapid rate that it became slightly ill. Finally, as the balloon showed no signs of slowing and was clearly headed for a swamp, the paper continued, he said he heard one of the aviators below shouting, he's going to jump. He climbed over the side and parachuted safely to the ground, landing at around 4 p.m. near Golden Gate, Illinois, more than 100 miles from where he took off. He was swiftly taken back to Scott in one of the planes that had been trailing him, where, the Akron Journal writes, his return brought the congratulations of assembled Army officers and spectators and the enthusiastic greeting of his wife. By May 16th, the data from his instruments was authenticated by the Bureau of Standards as the highest altitude balloon flight in history. The Fort Worth Star Tribune wrote that in setting a new world altitude record for free balloons, Captain Hawthorne C. Gray, USA, had come closer to the stars than any other balloonist of all time. But there was a problem. The Federation Aeronautique Internationale would not recognize the record because Federation rules required that the pilot land with his craft. In parachuting out, Gray might have saved his own life, but he cost himself the record. Clearly, another flight was needed, and that would come six months later, on November 4th. This time, Gray's balloon launched at 2.22 p.m. The Oakland Tribune reported the next day that, drifting at a low altitude, the S-80-241 was sighted by farmers late last night in the wooded valley near Sparta, Tennessee. It was coursing lazily over the scratchy mountains. The balloon, deflated, was found in a tree the next day by two farm boys. Captain Gray's lifeless body was unbruised, and his oxygen mask was still attached. The remains were identified by a note sewn into his clothing. The Tribune reported that physicians who examined the body said indications were that he had been dead for hours. They expressed the belief that Gray had died either from suffocation or heart failure. There are a few theories. Maybe his oxygen system malfunctioned or the tubes were accidentally cut when he was removing ballast. Maybe he simply lost track of time and went beyond his oxygen supply. The paper reported, One official said Captain Gray's dogged determination to set an official altitude record probably caused him to ascend higher and higher, even as his supply of oxygen gradually decreased. The last entry in Gray's log ended at 40,000 feet, and by then his handwriting was being described as indistinct, signifying that he was already growing weak. But the instruments in the balloon indicated that the balloon had reached between 42 and 43,000 feet. The newspaper The Nashville Courier wrote that he attained his ambition, and in doing so, lost his life. He was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And while his record might never have been official, it was certainly real. Like Icarus of Greek mythology, perhaps he simply flew too close to the sun. He might never have attained the fame that Lindbergh did in 1927, but he flew higher than any other human before him ever had. 2022 represents the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. Aim high, fly, fight, win. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.